Hello everyone. Good afternoon. Let me just get settled here. All right. So good afternoon everyone. Just a few things at the top and then happy to jump in and take your questions. So first I want to start with an update on the Maritime Humanitarian Corridor off the coast of Gaza. On Saturday, May 25th, four U.S. Army vessels supporting the Maritime Humanitarian Aid Mission in Gaza were affected by heavy sea states, causing these motorized pier sections, which are used to stabilize the Trident Pier, to break free from their anchors due to a loss in power and subsequently beach ashore. As of today, one of the Army vessels that was beached on the coast of Israel near Ascalon has been recovered. The second vessel that was also beached near Ascalon will be recovered in the next 24 hours, and the remaining two vessels that were beached near the Trident Pier are expected to be recovered in the next 48 hours. Efforts to recover the vessels are underway with the assistance from the Israeli Navy. In addition, due to high sea states and a North African weather system, earlier today a portion of the Trident Pier separated from the pier that is currently anchored into the coast of Gaza. As a result, the Trident Pier was damaged and sections of the pier need rebuilding and repairing. Therefore, over the next 48 hours, the Trident Pier will be removed from its anchored position on the coast and towed back to Ashdod, where U.S. Central Command will conduct repairs. The rebuilding and repairing of the pier will take at least over a week and, will, and following completion will need to be re-anchored to the coast of Gaza. The pier proved highly valuable in delivering aid to the people of Gaza. Thus, upon completion of the pier, repair and reassembly, the intention is to re-anchor the temporary pier to the coast of Gaza and resume humanitarian aid to the people who need it most. To date, over 1,000 metric tons have been delivered from the pier to the marshalling area for onward delivery by humanitarian organizations and into the hands of Palestinians. Alongside our USAID teammates, we remain committed to working with the international community to get aid into Gaza as quickly as possible. And as we have more information and more updates, we'll be sure to pass that along. Switching gears, the Secretary earlier today hosted the Angolan Minister of Defense to discuss the growing U.S.-Angola bilateral defense relationship. This visit builds on the success of the 2017 Memorandum of Understanding, the 2022 Joint Statement, and Secretary Austin's trip to Angola in September 2023. A full readout of this meeting will be available on defense.gov. And finally, tomorrow, Secretary Austin will depart for a trip to Singapore, Cambodia, and France, his 10th trip to the Indo-Pacific as the Department of Defense continues to strengthen U.S. relationships with allies and partners in support of a shared regional vision for peace, stability, and deterrence. Secretary Austin will deliver plenary plenary, sorry, that word was tough for me, remarks at the Shangri-La Dialogue in Singapore and meet with many of his counterparts to include Singapore, ROC, Japan, ASEAN, and others. He is also planning to meet Admiral Dong, Minister of National Defense of the People's Republic of China. In Cambodia, the Secretary will meet with senior officials following his November 2022 visit to Phnom Penh for the ASEAN Defense Minister's Meeting Plus. And in France, the secretary will participate in the president, with the president in commemoration of the 80th anniversary of the D-Day invasion of Europe in World War II. We will, of course, have more information on these events as they occur over the next week. And before I start taking questions, I'd like to welcome back uh, Natasha, who also just got married. So congratulations. And with that, happy to jump into questions. So Tara, do you want to start us off? Sure. Thank you. Um, to start with the peer, uh, for the food aid that has not been delivered but was intended to go to the pier over this yeah. next week, is there any alternative route for it to get to the people of Gaza, such as increased airdrops, et cetera? You're talking about the aid that's currently in Cyprus? Uh, right, that was going to be headed through the pier. So some of um, that aid that is currently in Cyprus is being loaded onto vessels. So when the pier is re-anchored back um, onto the Gaza shore, uh, that aid would already be pre-positioned and can roll off pretty immediately. Um, for the rest of the aid that's um, in Cyprus, that's still an ongoing conversation that USAID is leaving, leading in terms of how best to uh, move that aid to the to Gaza. And what about airdrops? Any talk about increasing the number of airdrops or anything like that? Um, right now, we, I mean, we haven't uh, 
we continue to do airdrops when possible. Um, I don't think airdrops would be done out of Cyprus, but if there's a way to move aid that we could reposition it somewhere else and be able to uh, conduct an airdrop um, from somewhere else, that would certainly be a possibility. But right now, the aid that's in Cyprus would either be preloaded onto other vessels or rerouted uh, via USAID means. Okay, just one more peer and then another topic. Sure. Um, the service members that were injured last week, what's the status of all those three? Um, I believe two of them have returned to duty, um, but you know what? Let me let me take that question on the two, and those were minor injuries, but I believe we had read out that they were planning to be returned to duty, so um, let me just get back to you on that. Um, the third service member that was um, uh, in critical condition still remains in critical condition. Okay, and then um, on the airstrike this weekend in Rafa, um, was it a U.S. bomb that was used in that airstrike? or U.S. provided bomb that was used in that airstrike? Have the Israelis been able to assure you that it wasn't? I do not know what type of munition was used in that airstrike. I'd have to refer you to the Israelis to speak to that. But if it was, shouldn't, I mean, shouldn't the U.S. be doing something to prevent additional airstrikes like this? Well, in every single case, uh, whenever the secretary speaks to his counterpart, Minister Gallant, um, and you've heard us say both publicly from here and privately, uh, we always urge um, the IDF to consider civilian casualties in any type of operations that they conduct. Um, we're going to continue to urge them to take every single precaution and to do more to protect innocent civilians. But in terms of this particular strike, I just don't have more information for you. Trace. I understand because I get confused with terminology of the sure. spear and the causeway. So yeah. that thing that was attached to the coast of Gaza has been removed completely. It's go it's in the process of that, being removed. It will be moved to Ashdod and then eventually come back. That's right. Think of it as um, the way I described it, and I tried to make it as uh, understandable as possible, but uh, obviously not obviously having a visual, it's kind of difficult. Think of that trident pier as having like a large T that top part of the T disconnected. So that has been recovered, but in order to reassemble everything, it's gonna, yep, it's gonna uh, uh, detach from the coastline, move up to Ashdod, be reassembled, and then reattach, re-anchor back. Got it, and just on Rafa, um, the secretary I'm sure has obviously received intel briefings, I'm sure he's seen images. What's his reaction been, um, I mean, you know, the argument is this could not have been done without US weapons, is he, proud of being associated with the Israeli military, which now appears to have killed, you know, tens of thousands of civilians and, and many children just over the weekend. Is he proud? Is he ashamed? What's his sort of, how does he look at the situation, I guess, from an emotional standpoint? Look, I think the secretary, like all of us, uh, saw the devastating imagery that came out of Rafa. I know you saw it, you posted about it as well. Um, with anything like this, with any type of strike, um, it's absolutely devastating to see the loss of life. Um, and that's why in every single conversation that the secretary has with Minister Gallant, um, he reemphasizes the fact that there needs to be more done to protect innocent lives. Um, we, I believe the secretary had a conversation with Minister Gallant last week. They talk almost weekly. Um, I don't have any calls to preview today or, or read out, but assured you that anytime he speaks to Minister Gallant, this is something that, that comes up in conversation. Nancy. Um, a couple questions. Sergeant sure. Sanders, Kennedy Sanders' family says they still haven't received an autopsy. She was killed January in Jordan. And I was wondering if you could find, at least take the question of why that hasn't happened and when they can get that. I don't have anything for you on that. Um, I'd refer you to, you know, the services to speak more on the autopsy results. It, it's obviously, um, if you're talking about Tower 20. Two, um, that is an ongoing investigation. So I'd assume it has to do with the investigation well, itself. Am I taking the question because I think it's sure. I can take the question. Um, and I want to follow up on Tara and Adrice's question because I guess I'm having a hard time understanding. Um, the secretary not that long ago was in the position of deciding whether to do strikes in the Middle East. Just last week, he said he needed to see things done a lot differently. And this was a strike done adjacent to a displacement camp. I guess what I'm trying to understand is um, why does the secretary continue to support these kinds of operations in Rafa um, on sites where it's not clear that the risk was so imminent that it required conducting such a strike adjacent to a camp? You, you mentioned several times that the, he mentions this in his calls with his Israeli counterpart, but um, 
I think we've been hearing that for months and it doesn't seem to be changing the course. So given that he showed so much discretion when he was in uniform, that he's called for things to be done a lot differently, I'm having a hard time understanding why he continues to support the Rafa operation as it's been carried out thus far. Thanks, Nancy, for the question. Um, so I think we have to separate things a bit. Um, I think the, I don't think you mean this, but I think the question is implying that we're somehow green lighting Israeli operations as they happen in Rafah. We are, have to make this very, very clear. We're not on the ground, not our operations. We have nothing to do with how they conduct operations on the ground. And as the secretary has said, we don't support a large scale operation within Rafah. We are seeing movements within Rafah. We are, of course, seeing the imagery that came from the strike that happened um, over the weekend. No matter what anyone says, those images, what's happening on the ground, it's horrific, it's heartbreaking, and it needs to stop. We also have to remember that we are supporting Israel in their fight against Hamas. And this is a terrorist organization that embeds itself within tunnels, that is using hostages, innocent civilians as human as human shields and continues to do so. So we are going to support Israel as they work to defeat Hamas, but we're also going to continue to tell Israel, both publicly and privately, that absolutely more can be done and should be done. And we're not hesitating from that. And every time the secretary has a conversation with Minister Gallant, um, it is direct, it is very frank, and um, it's res it's respectful, but he is very direct. And um, you know, I think again, we're going to continue to say that from from here, both both publicly and privately. But I, I I have to urge you to remember that this is not our operation. We're not on the ground, and therefore um, we can't. We're not calling the shots as they happen. I appreciate that, but the U.S. is providing weapons. I wonder if yeah. you could, if we could get a list, or do you? If this would be a question you could take. When has the U.S. conducted a strike near a displacement camp within a kilometer or two of one? Just to give me some sense of um, how the U.S. has conducted operations around displacement camps. I can't think of one offhand, but I was wondering if that was a question. Yeah, I think in terms of what you're referring to is in um, what was what the Israelis have said about the Rafa operation. Um, and sorry, I'm just trying mm -hmm. to understand if if there we can get a list of. I can't think of an instance where the U.S. has conducted a strike so near a displacement camp, and I'm just trying to send, ask if there's a way we, could, if that would be a question to take in case there's something I'm missing. Yeah, again, yeah. totally hear your, totally hear your question, but just again, if I take that question, we're comparing apples and oranges, and right now the U.S. is not on the ground in Gaza. So let me just holistically, what we are looking at right now is an operation in Rafah or in, in in Gaza that the is that the United States government has nothing to do with that has nothing we're not we're not on the ground this is not our operation uh, yes we are continuing to provide Israel with the weapons it needs to defeat Hamas um, and we certainly welcome the reports uh, I think overnight or early this morning that an, an investigation has been opened to look into this incident but again we can't compare the two things because we're not on the ground doing these operations and I have to remind you that uh, Hamas is has created and is operating in a very condensed environment and an environment where they have a very intricate network of tunnel systems that frankly we have not been up against. So again, it's comparing apples and oranges here. So I just I urge you to take a, a step back here and, and I and I understand the question. I understand the intent behind it. Um, but I do just have to urge that these are two very different situations. Okay, I yep. it. If you want to take another break. All right, I'm gonna move on, but yeah. Um, just a second ago, you said sure. you guys have nothing to do with what's going on on the ground. But the Correct. Problem, we have no boots on the ground. It's not our military operation. But, um, the administration in recent weeks has withheld weapon shipments for reasons that have been said to, yeah. um, I guess, alter or prevent the Israelis from doing what the U.S. doesn't want to happen in Rafah. So um, is it still the Pentagon's assessment this is a limited, what was the terminology used here? Limited operation. Is that still the assessment? That is right now. It is still our assessment that uh, what is happening in Rafah and what the IDF are doing, uh, it is limited in scope. Okay. And so what is the department's assessment of what happened over the weekend? Well, we're still waiting to uh, see the results of the investigation, which was just started by the IDF, I believe, this weekend. Um, they have released uh, some initial findings about that 
you know, that strike that occurred. But um, I don't really want to get ahead of the investigation. We need to see what they present us and then, you know, happy to uh, get back to you on that. Did you guys reach out to them asking or did they reach out to you guys trying to explain what happened? Uh, you, as you can imagine, all levels of this uh, government at different agencies were in touch with uh, various counterparts throughout the weekend to figure out and determine uh, what exactly happened and to get more information. Um, this is just developing over the last 24, 48 hours. So uh, when we have more information, I'm certainly happy to share it. But right now, it's a preliminary investigation, um, and we, we, we have to allow that to continue its course. One, one final sure. on the pier. Do you have an idea? So it, the cost was around $320 million, the ballpark that you guys gave. Yeah. Um, is that $320 million? Do you guys have to spend that again? to I mean, what's the, what's No. That? We don't have to spend it again. Um, I don't have an updated budget cost, but our initial assessments is, is still approximately around $300 million. Um, should that change, should that fluctuate either up or down, I'd certainly let you know. Laura. Oh, I'm sorry. Can I go to Liz and then Laura? I had pointed to Liz and then I'll come to you. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Sabrina. Yeah. Um, do you have a projected number of like the amount of aid that is going to be delayed because of the suspension? I don't have a projected number of the amount of aid. That's something that USAID might be able to speak to just a bit better about what's um, actually housed and allocated in Cyprus. Um, I certainly, I mean, I would point out the fact that, you know, we have been able to surge or get over a thousand metric tons over that pier into Gaza. So we know it's effective, but the most efficient way to get aid in would be through the land routes. And you've said, you said it a few minutes ago, um, Secretary Austin continues to have hard conversations mm -hmm. with his Israeli counterpart. Um, how does this suspension affect those conversations? I know he's been pushing for land routes. How, do the, how does the conversations affect the like suspension the fact, of the... Yeah, that this um, isn't working as it should because of the tough sea states, um, you know, does this create uh, more of a need for land routes, or, or what? How is he going to well, deal with that? There's never been um, there's never been a time where we haven't been advocating for the land routes to be open. And at a certain points, you know, when we did see a closing or um, less aid getting in through the crossings, that was something that you heard not just from the secretary urging, but from different levels of government, um, different agencies urging for um, these land routes to open. You saw um, the National Security Advisor also recently in the region. Um, so again, we continue to urge for the land crossings to be opened at all levels of government. Um, as we've said, and I know, I, I know I'm reiterating something that you know, but this is a temporary pier. It's a temporary solution. It is not going to be anywhere near getting close into how many trucks can get into Gaza um, through the pier. So um, in any of the conversations that the secretary has with Minister Gallant, it's always a topic, the humanitarian assistance. It consistently comes up. Um, and the Israelis, we are seeing more land crossings opening up. We are seeing more trucks getting in. Is it enough? It's not. More needs to be done. Um, we need to see those crossings continue to open up to allow more trucks in. Laura. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to ask a separate question about Rafa, but there have been some reports today that um, of Israeli tanks in central Rafa. Yeah. I was wondering if you could verify that information. Um, and then also Israel has said it's expanding its operation in Rafa. So is this, does DOD still assess that this is a limited operation? Yeah, nothing has changed from what I said earlier. We still assess it's a limited operation. Um, I've seen those reports. We are seeing movement within Rafa. That doesn't mean that it's limitation in its scope and scale has changed. Are we still, is the U.S. still sending weapons to Israel? Yes, security assistance continues to flow. When was the last time there was a weapon? That I, I, I don't know. I don't have, as, as aid continues to flow off, uh, it's, you know, pretty consistent, but I direct you to the State Department for more because it's all through sales. Are we sending additional dumb bombs? Was it only that one shipment that was It's only that one shipment that was paused. We're sending additional I don't have anything, again, I don't have anything for you. I don't have like a readout of what we've sent to uh, Israel since um, since we paused that shipment. We did pause that shipment that included that, those 2,000 pound bombs. I'm not aware that we've sent any more, but again, as security assistance continues to flow. They have what they need um, to uh, defeat Hamas, um, but I don't have a readout of every specific weapon system, munition, everything that has been sent to Israel since the, the that pause in that one shipment. Constantine. 
Thanks, Sabrina. Um, you mentioned earlier in your statement that the four army boats uh, broke free from their anchors due to a loss in power and subsequently beached ashore. So uh, just to clarify, did the boats suffer some sort of malfunction or problem aboard? I'm not aware of any problem aboard or malfunction. I believe it was because of the high sea states that it caused it to, uh, that it caused the vessels to lose power. Okay, gotcha. Um, and uh, just a quick follow-up. So three of the Army boats are still beached ashore. Is their recovery being complicated by the fact that we are barred, the soldiers are barred from setting food boots, boots on the ground in Gaza? No, the Israeli um, Navy has been a supportive partner in making sure that we can get those vessels back and operational. Um, it wasn't a hindrance when we had to anchor the temporary pier into Gaza. We had uh, worked with um, Israeli engineers um, and gone through the proper training in order that needed to be done to anchor that pier um, into the coast. So, no, it's not a hindrance at all. Mike. Um, once you uh, pull the remains of the, uh, the pier back to Israel and then bring it back to Gaza, what's to stop it from breaking apart again the next time the waves get a little choppy? And is this thing a little too delicate for use uh, in this situation? That's a good question. Um, I think, unfortunately, we had a perfect storm of high sea states. And then, as I mentioned, um, this North African weather system also came in at the same time, creating... Um, uh, not an optimal in, uh, environment to operate this J lots, uh, this temporary pier. Um, look, I can't predict the weather, uh, but we believe that uh, given the time of year, um, uh, we will be able to re anchor this pier and it will be able to be operational and hopefully. Uh, weather conditions won't hinder it anymore. But we always make assessments based on you know environmental factors, and if we need to you know adjust, we will. But uh, we hope that it will be fully operational with just a little over a week. Tom, thanks, Sabrina. Yeah. Um, Nikki Haley was on the border with Lebanon today in northern Israel, and she was photographed writing on a bomb: "Finish them, America loves Israel." Is that sort of thing helpful? And what do you make of a potential shadow cabinet member traveling to? Israel. Yeah, I don't have a comment on that. Okay, second one. Um, I know you said you welcome the Israeli probe into what happened in Rafah. Um, does the Pentagon deem credible the IF, IDF's claim that this attack was a mistake? Well, that's certainly what the investigation should reveal. Um, and we have confidence that uh, a government like the Israeli government can investigate and can do a proper and thorough investigation. And finally, if I may, just on the, um, on the boats that went onto the shore at Gaza there was how did the sailors or the soldiers get off the boats like they didn't at any point go on the beach I believe uh, most of our soldiers were able to remain on the vessels and uh, still are are currently on them and that will be um, you know within the next 24 48 hours uh, the Israeli Navy will be helping uh, push those vessels back and hopefully they'll be fully operational by then Anton Thank you. Yes, sorry, you know, sorry. <laughs> Thank yeah. you. Um, so I asked you a question about 21 days, three weeks ago here, that you know, this vague distinction between a major military operation and a limited military operation in Rafa. And you said, quote, a military operation would put at risk civilian lives and we're against anything that puts civilian lives at risk. On Sunday, it not only put civilian lives at risk, it burnt them alive and decapitated the child. It, is this policy of major, limited, supportive, non-supportive, is this policy not failed, would you not say? And is this not enabling the Israeli government to do whatever they like? Because it's not, it's limited, but it burned four to five people. So what, like, you know, that's kind of the stance in the Israeli government. Well, we s certainly take seriously what happened over the weekend. We've all seen the images. They're absolutely horrific. Um, to Nancy's question earlier, I mentioned that the secretary has very direct and frank conversations with his counterpart. Um, that's exactly what they are. They are tough conversations, and we do have them with our friends. Um, and we are going to continue to do that. Um, do we support what happened over the weekend? Of, of course, we don't want to see a loss of life like that. We don't want to see these images as much as you don't. Um, and you know, it certainly speaks to the challenges of what's happening on the ground. But we absolutely want to see innocent lives protected. And that's why publicly, privately, we're going to continue to urge um, uh, the Israeli, the IDF, when they conduct operations, to take into account civilian casualties.
Uh, if Reese asked that question, actually, but you, you know, you said that you don't want to see those pictures. I definitely don't want to. But if I sat through a phone call with the Israeli uh, Defense Minister, like many times, that they're explaining to me that it's a mistake. We, we're going to conduct investigations. I think, to say the least, I'd be frustrated, or I'd feel like I was being fooled. So, what's the mo mood in this department? Like, you keep hearing the same thing, and you're relaying the same things, and you know, days change, months change, but like the, the statements don't really change. Well. I think you have to also appreciate that uh, we don't read out every nitty gritty detail of conversations, but we do believe that when it comes to some of the operations and some of the way that um, the IDF has conducted itself within uh, Gaza, that they have listened to us, that they have taken into some of the lessons that we have learned and some of the things that you know Secretary Austin certainly uh, imparted on Minister Gallant. Um, again, we don't want to see this tragic loss of life continue. We conti we urge the Israelis, uh, the IDF, to do better when it comes to taking into account civilian lives and, and civilian harm. Um, and we're going to, I know it might sound frustrating to you, but uh, what we can do with our friends is to continue to have these hard conversations. And that's exactly what we're going to continue to do. Yeah, in the back. Yeah. Thank you for doing this. Uh, change the topic to the North Korean launch of the uh, military reconnaissance satellite yesterday. Uh, so North Korea said the launch failed uh, due to the uh, air blast of the new type satellite carrier rocket during the first stage flight. And also the cause of the accident is attributable to the reliability of operation of the newly developed liquid oxygen uh, plus petroleum engine. So what is the U.S. assessment um, on this uh, launch? And secondly, uh, do you see any evidence or signs that uh, Russia has supplied the first stage rocket for the latest launch or any assistance to the North Korea? I don't have anything on for the latter part of your question, uh, uh, re Russia and um, North Korea. Um, on the first part, I believe Indo-PACOM put out a statement as well. I direct you to that. Um, we've seen these types of launches before. Um, you know, they're destabilizing. Uh, we always coordinate with our partners in the region. Um, but I don't have anything more for you beyond the statement that was put out this weekend. Uh, yeah, right over here. Uh, thank you, Sabrina. Mm -hmm. You have a comment on recent attacks on the U.S. brand restaurants in Baghdad, Iraq. Uh, such as KFC, like since last Saturday, two KFC branches and one uh, Geely House uh, branches were attacked. I'm and sorry, I just don't have anything for you on that. Uh, okay, and secondly, the leader of the National Nationals uh, Movement Party in Turkey, uh, who is alliance to the ruling party of Turkey, has said Turkey and Syria should conduct a bilateral operation in northeast Syria, uh, where U.S. forces, uh, with it is. Um, as the as the uh, partners are fighting against ISIS, how does the Pentagon look at a Turkish operation in the region? I'm sorry. Can you? Rep I'm I'm so sorry. Could you just repeat your question? Yeah, the leader of the nationalist uh, movement, mm -hmm. Nationalist Party in Turkey, who's yeah. alliance to uh, the ruling party of Turkey, yeah. Erdogan's party, he has said that Turkey and Syria should conduct a bilateral operation uh, into uh, northeast of Syria. Oh, uh, I see. Okay. Where the uh, U.S. forces with its uh, alliance uh, or partners, SDF, are fighting against ISIS. Got it. So I don't have anything for you on that. What I can tell you is our partnership with the SDF is to ensure the enduring defeat of ISIS. Uh, we partner with them, as you know, on, on various missions to um, ensure that ISIS remains um, or cannot resurge uh, in a way that it was you know, many years ago. Um, but I just don't have more to offer a comment on that. I'm just going to go to the phones and then happy to come back in the room. Uh, Missy Ryan, Washington Post. Hey, Sabrina, thank you. Just to follow up on the earlier questions about the um, strike over the weekend. So you said earlier that the that you all don't know if it's um, a, a U.S. provided munition or munitions that were dropped as part of that, but that, you know, there's lots of conversations that have been happening. Can you just tell us has, and also that the, um, upper the investigation is ongoing, but has the has the department asked for that information? I would assume that that would be something that you all would want to know. And do you have any um, independent information about whether or not it's accurate the Israeli claim that what appears to have occurred or what occurred was 
uh, the you know ignition of a weapons cache or some sort of secondary explosion. Thanks. Missy, yeah, I've seen what they initially put out. I think that was in their preliminary findings that you're mentioning. Again, the on the investigation is ongoing, so I'm not uh, trying to get ahead of that. Uh, we expect the Israelis to conduct a thorough and independent investigation, but I'd like to wait uh, till we get to the, the result of that investigation before we make any judgments. Um, I'm going to take one more from the phone, and then happy to come back in the room. Uh, Sam Fowler, uh, Tokyo Broadcast. My question is answered. Thank you. Joseph? Just to follow up, Peter, you said that U.S. troops are still on those boats, vessels. Yeah. On those vessels. Mm -hmm. Do you have an idea of how many? I don't. I would refer you to CENTCOM to speak to that. You guys can't take that, can you? I would refer you to CENTCOM to take that. Just a second one. This, the pier, I mean, everything that mm -hmm. just happened with it, is it a result? I, it just happened, but is it a result of poor planning, of poor quality of, of whatever you know materials were used? Because a few weeks back, we asked in this room, we asked Pat, um, you know, how long can this pier be used for? Because there are presumed high tides that come in, usually towards the end of August, or not even, you know, into June yeah. this happened. So, I mean, what is it? What's, what's, you know, do you guys put a lot of money into this and then it didn't la it lasted for less than two weeks? Well, in those two weeks, what I would say is that over a thousand metric tons of aid got to the people in Gaza. So I don't think that's a total loss. Um, I think it's pretty important for the people that are suffering right now, that are in a dire humanitarian situation, to get whatever aid they can wh by whatever means. Um, if you want to characterize it as a failure, I leave it to you. What I can tell you is that we don't control the weather. There was an unfortunate, uh, unique pattern of events with high seas and another storm that came in that caused the J-Lots to become uh, inoperable during that time. You better believe that U.S. Central Command Forces are going to do everything in their power to make sure that this is back and operational as soon as possible. This is a mission directive that was set up by the president. We take it very seriously. We're Just as you are, we're seeing the reports on the ground of what people need, uh, whether it be life-saving food, water, medical needs. Um, we want to do everything possible to help. Um, and it is our forces, it is our men and women who are running towards the problem and trying to do everything they can to find a solution. This is not going to be the solve for land routes. Um, airdrops are not the solve for land routes. Uh, we need those land crossings to open. We need them to open every single day to allow more trucks in and um, and and in through into Gaza. But I. I I have to push back on the fact that this is a failure because at the end of the day, uh, you have m you know, men and women out there separated from their families who are putting themselves first, um, who are putting others first to try and be part of a life-saving humanitarian mission that has seen over a thousand metric tons of aid come in. And I think that is commendable. Um, so look, I can't tell you that this gets anchored back into the beach, and three weeks later, there's another storm. I, I can't predict the environment, but right now, uh, during this time, as you said, you know, up in August, we, we could see higher um, sea swells. Right now, this is usually a time of relative calm, so hopefully when um, we are able to re-anchor the pier back in, you'll be able to see that aid flow off in a pretty uh, steady stream. Uh, okay, Louis, and then I'll come to Idris and take a few more. Sure, I, yeah. I have a pure question, but first I want to ask sure. you about something you said earlier um, when you talked about the imagery of the um, airstrike over the weekend. Yeah. Um, you said it was heartbreaking. You said you said it was horrific, which I think you also said um, later. later. Mm -hmm. um, but you also said it needs to stop. Um, what exactly are you referring to when you say it needs to stop? Are you talking about, I mean, because obviously you, you're waiting for the results of this investigation to come through. But what exactly are you referring to? Are you referring to intentionality? Are you talking to uh, intent? Are you talking about uh, targeted attacks that impact civilian lives? I think, and I, I think I had more to say after that, but the, I'm reading your quotes here. yeah, so what needs to, to stop is we need, we need our, those vulnerable civilians uh, to be protected. We need to see, um, you know, the, the population that is concentrated within Rafah and other places in Gaza um, to be better protected. And we want to see the IDF um, incorporate some of the lessons that we continue to impart on them um, 
you know, better solidified in their operations. So the interesting part is that uh, part of what the administration, this building in particular, has been asking of the IDF is that they be more precise in their targeting, So, which would, I think, is the definition that you are putting forward of what a limited operation is in Tarafa. And in this scenario, it appears that, you know, targeted strikes may have had a secondary effect somehow, but yet the Israelis may be following that, and yet it leads to, you know, a situation like this one. So I think some of my words are being extrapolated here, but when it comes to what happened over the weekend, the IDF is conducting an investigation. And as I've said, I'm going to let the IDF continue that investigation uh, before commenting or making any further judgments on that. And then uh, sure. My peer question is about um, February, uh, excuse me, uh, May 17th was first day of operations. By the time we get to J June 5th, which may be the time frame you're talking about a week from now when repairs are going in, we may have eaten up already the first month of operations in what was foreseen as a three month operation. So is it giving pause to uh, the department that you may have to look at other alternatives via other sea routes into Israel or elsewhere into Gaza to supplement all this aid that is currently being. I understand how it's all being accumulated on the Benavides, but I mean, other than that, because otherwise now we're going to be one month into this without full operational capability. So a lot there. Um, as you might remember, even though there there are folks uh, that that do give out timelines on how long certain things are supposed to operate. Uh, we did not put a timeline on how uh, long the um, temporary pier could operate. We said that approximately in this window is when we have that time frame. Um, but again, we didn't put an end date on this. So we're going to continue to operate this temporary pier for as long as we can. Um, in terms of other routes or ways for the aid to get in, what, you, what you're asking is, uh, because of this delay, like how will other aid get in? And I think, you know, I, I sort of spoke to this, but that's what USAID is trying to figure out other ways um, for the aid that's already on Cyprus. If it's land routes or other ways for it to get in, we're working through that. Um, and you have to remember, it's not just USAID, it's other NGOs, other partners, um, other countries who are invested in sending, US, uh, in sending aid to Cyprus. Um, some of that aid will be uh, unloaded onto some of our vessels, so it's pre positioned and so when the temporary pier is re-anchored back onto the onto the shore um, we're pretty much ready to to roll off right away um, but that's something that USAID is working through with other partners and I just I don't have a better sense for you Idris and then I'll go to the back and then we'll wrap. piece that um, drifted away yeah. earlier today th did that end up off the coast of Gaza or Israel I believe it was off the coast of Gaza and it was recovered and then how did did anyone have to come off the here, how did you remove it without getting on shore, I guess? It didn't, it, I believe it didn't, um, it was still in the water, so it was able to so be. Actually got more on the Not to my knowledge. Yeah, in the back, yeah. Thank you so much, Sabrina. Um, uh, after what's happened uh, on the weekend uh, on Rafah, uh, so many reports we heard and read that they're talking about the U.S. red line in Rafah. So my question is, did the Secretary Austin outline uh, what that the red line is during his calls with the, the Israeli counterparts or any DOD officials with the Israeli officials and uh, did they specify where or what the red line is? Yeah, I, I don't have anything to to comment on lines. What I can tell you is we've been very clear when it comes to operations within Rafa. Um, we do not support or we've voiced our concerns with a major military operation within Rafa. Right now, as I've said uh, from here, our assessment right now is it's still limited. Yes, they are maneuvering within Rafa. Yes, they are continuing to make some headway further in, but we still believe it's limited in scale. Uh, yes, and then to Mike and then Tara. For the Italian television, I have a question mm -hmm. about what um, Stoltenberg, mm -hmm. the Secretary General, said, mm -hmm. um, um, I believe yesterday, about giving weapons to Ukraine. They said each state can do what they want if they want their weapons to be used towards Russia, that's fine. And that brought a lot of discussion um, in Europe because it can bring a war. If France, Macron decide to, to go for it, as example, what is the position of the Pentagon, please? And then I have another question. Sure, our position hasn't changed. Uh, we believe that in order for uh, 
we believe that Ukraine can be successful in its goals by continuing to take back its sovereign territory and using um, U.S. provided weapons um, to do that. So, but should the should the, let's say single state decide how to use their own weapons? In yeah, Ukraine? I can't speak for other countries. I can only speak for us. Um, yeah. We've given them. Uh, many different capabilities, artillery, uh, long-range air defenses, um, or air defenses. Um, again, our position hasn't changed in terms of how we believe the Ukrainians can be success successful on the battlefield, um, but I leave it to other countries to speak to their own weapons that they provide. I'm going to go to Mike. Can I do the second question? It's, okay. uh, it's about, uh, thank you, Sabrina. It's um, about Israel. Uh -huh. So we also, in Italy, we all support Israel, of course, but um, we seeing like a lack of strategy. So some European countries are like taking different position. So we don't want to talk about red lines, but everyone is looking are look is looking to the U.S. as leadership. So what are the boundaries that should be set for Gaza? I mean, on Hamas and on Israel to avoid further loss of lives. I think we've been pretty clear when it comes to. Um, are in our conversations with the Israelis and how the IDF is conducting operations. Uh, I'm not going to repeat everything that I've said from here, but um, we've been very public and very clear about what we expect in Rafah. We want to see a credible plan from them that takes civilians into account. Um, again, we are continuing to have these conversations with the Israelis. Uh, we believe more can be done to protect um, the lives of Palestinians that are that are on the ground and that are moving um, also out of places like Rafah into, um, you know, other areas. Uh, I'm not going to repeat everything that I've said earlier, but, you know, our conversations are ongoing and pretty frank when we have them. Yeah, Mike. Do you know what, percent, or what percentage of that 1,000 metric tons of aid that came to the pier has actually gone to the Palestinian people, and what percentage was taken by Hamas? And has that always been, like, the biggest problem in, in uh, Gaza? Is not, it's not so much getting aid there, but making sure once it's there that it gets to the right people. There has been an issue of self-distribution, but um, in terms of aid getting into the hands of uh, Palestinians, I would let USAID speak to that. Tara, and then we will wrap. Uh, just back to the pier. Sure. Is there any chance that the pier won't be reinstalled? I mean, if the sea states remain rough, does it just become a point of, you know, you could put it back in, but it'll fall apart again? No. Um, we believe that there needs to be uh, repairs that need to be made, um, some rebuilding to the pier. But at the end of the day, uh, when this became operational, you saw aid be begin to flow off that pier within, I think, 24 hours of when we were able to anchor it. We believe that uh, Central Command personnel will be able to repair it uh, a little bit more than a week it will probably take, and then it will be able to be re-anchored back in. I can't predict weather patterns. I can't predict that there won't be high seas again. Um, but from when it was operational, it was working. Um, and we just had sort of an, uh, an unfortunate confluence of weather storms that made it inoperable for a bit. Um, and that did cause some damage. But, you know, hopefully just a little over a week, we should be back up and running. So no matter what, the pier is going back in. Yes. Okay. All right. Thanks, everyone. Yeah.